today we will be turning to Genesis chapter 3. three. And we will be finishing off the chapter. So yes, last week we read the full chapter, but we only were able to look at verses 1 through 7. Today we're going to continue on and finish off the chapter. So if someone can read from verse 8 onwards. Thank you. So we start in verse 8. And remember, if you look at chapter 3 as a whole, usually we have a tendency of seeing it, and maybe some of your Bibles have a small little title there. Anyone have a Bible that has the, uh, the little mini titles at the beginning of the chapters? No? The fall of? Man, right. So usually this chapter is seen as the fall of man. <clears throat> I want us to look at this in a different light. I want to see this picture of Genesis chapter 3 as actually being not necessarily just the fall of man, but this is the proto-gospel, the first gospel. This is, from verse 8 onwards, the initial idea of what God's salvation plan is. And you will see all the different elements of it in Genesis chapter 3 itself. If you start from the very beginning of it, you see that uh, the sound of God is heard walking in the garden. So you have this beautiful image already of what was now being lost because of the disobedience of Adam and Eve. And God poses to them a very interesting question. What is the question that God asks? Where are you? Uh, this question begs the question, why is God asking this question? Why is God asking if He is God? God knows everything. He knew where they were before they were even there, before they even knew where to go and hide. He was the one who made the, whatever it was, the tree or the bush that they're now hiding behind. And when He made that tree or that bush or whatever it was, He knew that they would be hiding behind it. Why is He asking this question? This is a age-old paradox that a lot of people stumble over, a lot of people love to wrestle with, and some people find to be uh, quite invigorating. It's an interesting dilemma when an all-knowing God asks a question 
that he already knows the answer to. So why does he ask it? Well, let's think of it in, in human terms. Why do we ask questions to our kids when we already know the answer sometimes? Who broke this, for example? There's only one child in the room at the time. We know who broke it, but why do we ask that question? To elicit some sort of a response from the person that we're asking this question to. That's one reason why we ask questions. Another reason why we ask questions, to get us to commit to that response, to basically to learn something from it, right? Uh, for example, uh, if you were to take a 10 or let's make it a 15 year window of your life, uh, you can slide this window wherever you want. You can keep it from 1 to 15, or you can make it from whatever your current age is, minus 15. Move this window around wherever you want and tell me which window of your life did you learn the most about the scripture? Or which window of your life did you read the most scripture? What would you say? No one wants to say it. I, I, so some people will say the last 15 years. I would wager that a lot of people would probably say the first 15 years. Because those are the years when someone said, did you read your Bible, Mone or Mole? Now there's no one to ask us that question. Without anyone to ask us that question, where are you? It doesn't really matter where we are, what we do, what we are thinking. We just gonna kind of do what we feel like doing. But there's an intention behind why questions are asked at certain times. They're meant to shape, they're meant to mold, they're meant to direct the listener to a very specific thing. Where are you, Adam and Eve? Where are you today? This is not a question that was just asked sometime in ancient history and then God never asked it again. Now I think he continues to ask the same question over and over and over again. And I think in this question itself, you get the beginning whispers of the gospel message. I'll say four things, four parts, four times in this passage that I think point us towards this message of salvation here. And this is the first of them. Where are you? This question. Who is seeking who? God is seeking man, not the other way around. The gospel message is that, that God loved the world first, not the world first loved God. This is not a new thing. The psalmist says it, Paul says it, he says it like this, <clears throat> there is no one who seeks God, no, not one. Now. Well, what do we do, though, with that idea? Because there definitely are people who seek God, aren't there? Well, theologically, no. Nobody of their own accord seeks God. But, but, perhaps, perhaps if people hear this whisper, where are you? Then they might start seeking out that whisper. They might start answering the question, I'm here in this phase of my life. This is where I am. I need to find out who is calling me. And so those who seek are actually still under this idea, which is God is the one who first seeks out us. Genesis chapter 3, with all of God's wisdom, with all of God's sovereignty, he knew that Adam and Eve would fall. And he was going to show us from the beginning till the very end, I'm seeking you. Where are you, is the question. If we were to hear that question today, I think it would definitely change our perspective of where we ought to be, of how we ought to be, and where, who we should be listening to. Now the response of Adam and Eve, we could spend another sermon there itself, but we're not going to. Uh, one, time, two, because I think that's a sermon that any of us could preach by heart, right? It's the sermon that says that whenever we're confronted with the problem of ourselves, we just have this natural, effortless tendency to blame anyone and anything around us, but to never take responsibility for ourselves. We've met 
Roshan and I, we've met couples who have been in need of uh, counseling from time to time. And I can't remember how many times we've heard excuses being said. Uh, this is how I grew up. Or she always does it this way. If he never did that, I wouldn't have been doing this. And time and time again, we kept trying to get them to this point where they would realize, stop pointing the finger, stop blaming. The first thing in order to understand redemption, to understand salvation, is to know where you are. To understand your responsibility, to understand your flaws, your shortcomings before God. Without that, without that, there is no path. That is the beginning of this way towards salvation. Now, how do you do this, though? Okay, Adam doesn't really admit where he is, but at least he responds back. What is God's response thereafter? Well, he goes on, and again, we're not going to have time to talk about all of the different side elements that are there, but I'll just draw your attention to the passage 14 to, 20, uh, to 19, where God is addressing the serpent, Eve, and Adam. And he tells them the consequences of their actions. But very specifically, let us look at verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman. So he's speaking to the serpent here. And between your offspring and hers, he will strike your head, you will strike his heel. What is this referring to? Well, one, I think it refers to the current present state that we see life in, which is this battle between the sons of The serpent? Yeah. Versus the sons of humanity. The son of man. You see this struggle between good and evil. Who keeps winning in that battle? I mean, turn on the news and you'll know who's winning. Time and time again, no matter who we're talking about, aside from Jesus, no one is able no one is able to crush the head of this offspring of the serpent. No one is able to claim victory and say that we've defeated evil once and for all. But there is this character. There is this son of man. Or you can say son of woman here, yeah, because it's talking to Eve, and that's right too, especially in today's day and age in philosophy. The son of uh, Eve comes along and strikes the head of the serpent. But what happens to this character in the process of crushing the head of the serpent? What happens? His heel is bit. Um, what happens if you get bit by a snake? Now, with our scientific mind, we will first say, is it a poisonous snake or a non-poisonous snake? And all these different questions we like to ask. Um, just kind of think of uh, the serpents that were present during the time of uh, Exodus, right? Uh, what, kind, what happens then when you get bit by a serpent? You die. You die. Uh, does it matter where you get bit? No. It is a fatal blow. Now, link that. Link that story. And remember that this is God presenting the gospel here. He is foreshadowing the character and the work of Jesus Christ. How Jesus will crush the head of the serpent, but in the process, he will be bit. And he will die from it. But it's not a death that can't be overcome by God, so don't worry about that part just yet. But just know that it is serious. You go and you read uh, passages from Isaiah. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Here itself, you get a prophecy, not from a prophet, not from an angel, but from God himself saying, remember when I asked you that question, where are you? And for a moment, you probably thought you didn't know where I was. Okay, I, I do know exactly where you are. And let me tell you exactly how this is going to end. This is going to end with me sending my son through the form of a human person 
so that the Son of Man will have triumph and victory over the son or the offspring of the serpent. And that will be to you the path of redemption, the path of restoration. So it started with God seeking and asking, where are you? But the very next task was not, okay now guys, make sure you're all behaving nicely. Make sure you're following all the rules that I'm telling you about. No, it, it, it went directly from where are you, and hopefully now today we will admit where we are, directly to, okay listen, I got this. I have this covered as well. I have the plan of redemption through my son and I'm going to take care of it. Don't worry. And you get a beautiful picture that is only still being understood today and by so many still being taken for granted, spoken of so long ago. That's the second thing. What's the third thing that I think foreshadows uh, salvation? If you go down to verse 21, and this you have to remember, don't read this uh, like a hardcore trained theologian with your you know, scholarly dictionary behind you. Uh, read it like, like a reader. Read it like a narrative. Read it like a story and be able to link parts of the story to other parts of the story. And think as you are part of the story. Verse 21, And the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and for his wife and clothed them. Why clothe them? Well, you kind of have to go back to the answer that Adam and Eve gave about where they are. Where was Adam and Eve, by the way? Or why were they hiding? Because they were naked. They were afraid because they were naked. Now, God then asks all these wonderful other questions. Who told you you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I told you not to eat from? Okay, let, let's put all that to the side just for now. The problem was their nakedness. Now, in pretty much every culture, shame and nakedness kind of go together. Uh, also linked in that is probably guilt. Guilt, shame, in comparison with nakedness, it's not a, a, it's not a big leap to take. Uh, you have then this idea that Adam and Eve are aware of their shame and of their guilt. So you see, even in the midst of their blaming, I think hints, tiny as they might be, of genuineness before God, which is enough, thank God. Because God addresses that genuineness by covering them by covering their shame, by taking away their fear that was stemming from their guilt. Now, how does he do this? Now, you have to, again, put yourself in the story. Did God go to the local store and pick up a shirt and a pant for them to wear? No. Where did he get these clothes from? Where did he get these clothes from? Animal skin. How do you get animal skin? You gotta kill the animal and take the skin off and then cover that on you. That's how it works. That's how it would be. Now imagine, imagine for a moment, uh, and this is a wild thought experiment. You're Adam and Eve, you're in the garden, everything is perfect. And then suddenly you see God take this animal, an animal that you kind of looked after, an animal that you named, an animal that you know that God created and said it is good, and he takes it and he kills it. And then suddenly there's all this red stuff coming out of it. This, this is stuff that you, we've never seen before. We don't even know what that is. But now this, this, this animal is dead. This thing that once had life is now dead, and we are covered with its blood. We are covered with its skin. Does that foreshadow anything? Does that hint towards anything? Of course it does. Of course it does. If you think about it, uh, and, and uh, most modern painters and even early Christian painters did not want to dwell on this, 
you would be very hard pressed to find any pictures of Jesus on the cross as he truly was, meaning naked. He was actually naked on the cross. But you won't find any painters, or very few, at least none that I'm aware of, that paint him like that. They all cover him. Now that's out of their own modesty because they feel unworthy to draw that picture. But the reality is that Christ was naked on the cross for us. Now, before we get to that point, let's go back and let's look at the Old Testament understanding of this idea of an animal being killed for the salvation of others. Because this is a pretty wild concept, I think, especially for us modern day human beings. In the Old Testament, the time of the Exodus, Moses told the rest of the Israelites that the tenth plague was going to be what? The death of every firstborn male. What do you need to do in order to avoid that curse? You take a pure, unblemished lamb. You kill it. You get the blood of that lamb and you wipe it over your doorpost. Now imagine, imagine if you're a father, if you're the mother, and your child sees you doing this and asks you, Papa, Mama, what are you doing? We are killing this lamb so we can put the blood of this lamb over this doorpost in order to be safe. Well, why? What did the lamb do? Why are you killing the lamb? Well, the lamb, lamb didn't do anything. The lamb is actually innocent. Why are you killing it then? What would ha be so wrong in just letting the animal go? Why do you need to kill it? And then the father, the mother, you would have to think about it for a while and then say, well, if we don't kill it, if we don't kill it, then we're going to die. Actually, you're going to die. If we don't kill it and put the blood over that, the curse stands and you would fall under that curse as well. And so now you have this idea, and then you, you, we're not even going to go into this element, uh, but the whole development of the sacrificial system and what it meant and what it pointed towards. Come now all the way to the New Testament. The gospel of the New Testament is there in Genesis chapter 3, where it talks about the idea that a perfect lamb, a person who did not deserve to die, dies in order that the curse that was due to us would be passed over us, that we would be safe. You go fast forward again into Revelation, and you get this idea that the holy ones, the, and, and that's not like some really hi-fi technical term, that really means all of us who believe in God, because we are set apart. Holy means to be set apart. It stems from the word to sanctify. You get this idea, this picture, that the ones that were set apart, the ones that were holy, are now being clothed in white so that they're no longer seen. The shame, the nakedness is no longer an issue anymore. And they get to have, once again, the direct presence of God in their lives. From Genesis chapter 3, you see that being presented. Now, what's the fourth thing that I was saying that there's four things in this passage? In the very end of this chapter, verse 24, he drove out the man at the east of the Garden of Eden and placed the cherubim and a flaming sword turning to guard the way of the tree of life. You know, going back to this question of God, where are you? And, and this whole thing of why why does he ask this question? We could ask, we could ask, why did God put that tree there in the first place? It's a very valid question. God knew that they would be making this mistake. Why did he put it there then? Well, after you wrestle with that question, you should also ask the question, which is the gospel side of it, why did God create a tree of life? Nobody ate from it yet. If no one's planning to eat from it, he could have never made it to begin with, but he, but he did. He made it. And so if he has an intention in creating the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, knowing that we would fall, 
he would also have an intention in creating the tree of life. And so from the very beginning, even before the fall happened, you see that God already prepared a salvation. That he is still totally in control in spite of the uncontrollable nature of humanity. God is still sovereign, and humans still have their freedom. You go figure it out. I've not figured it out. I know that both are true. And never let any church or doctrine water down either of these aspects. Please don't do that. Both are deeply affirmed throughout Scripture. God made the tree of life. And he did not want Adam and Eve to eat from it after the fall. Why? Because it was an act of mercy. It was an act of mercy that God did not allow them to eat from the tree at that point. Had they eaten from the tree in that fallen state, they would have forever been away from God. And so God holds it back so that they can understand that this tree of life, it only comes through Christ. There's only one way back into the garden. There's only one path towards restoration in this relationship with God. The tree of life is ready. It is available for anyone who comes to it. But first they have to hear the voice of God. First they have to know that God from the beginning never lost control and he had a plan in place of sending his son. They have to know the seriousness of sin, that it would cause blood to be shed, but to know that God's love was greater than the pain that it was inflicted on that animal or even on his son, so that he could clothe us once again. And by the time we get to the end of Revelation, there's that tree of life again, ready and waiting for us, producing fruits in every season, 12 kinds of fruits for the healing of the nations. Can read it. It's there, the very end of the book. From the beginning of the book till the end of the book, God knew exactly what he was doing. Now, to not distract from that, but just to say one other practical thing, which does tie into this idea of if God knows everything, then why does he ask? I've seen this question also posed in this way. If God knows everything, then why do I need to pray? If God knows my needs ahead of time, what's the point of it? Well, the same answers can be found when you look at Genesis chapter 3. Yes, you're right, God does already know. But do you know? Do you know where you are? Do you know what you need? Well, I'll start articulating it in prayer. It's possible that you'll realize that some of those needs are ridiculous needs. It's possible that you'll understand that some of those things that you pray about when you're talking about, Father, help me to love that person who has acted like this towards me, you might find that God is now changing your heart, shaping you. In the process of us praying, God, of course, He does already know, but we're starting to know what God knows now. And so that's why it's important that we continue in prayer. That's why it's important that we still do this thing today. It's not archaic, and it's not mechanical either. I had mentioned this before to uh, when we talked about the Lord's Prayer. Prayer is a tool. And if prayer is a tool, we should always ask the question, in whose hands are these tools? Oftentimes we think that this tool is in our hands. I pray to God, I have this screwdriver, and I will turn him this way or I will turn him that way. What we need to understand is actually God is the one holding this tool of prayer. And the more often we pray, God is turning us one way and turning us the other way and shaping us according to His image. This is why it's important that even though God knows everything, that we still use our human freedom and we pour out ourselves to Him so that we can discern what is His will for us. May the good Lord strengthen us to understand the beauty that has been there all along and to know that it's still here today and He speaks to us now. Amen.